All right. Well, it's a great crowd here, um, and uh, this this uh, conference has gotten bigger and bigger. We've been a part of it. Um, uh, I've been a part of it for uh, all six years that it's been around. And and I somebody yesterday I was or two days ago I was uh, speaking to another ETA group, and somebody said, "Well, Ron was around before ETA was even around." And and I think like, is this it has to be even is this close enough now? No. Oh, maybe it's not on. It's on. The green light is showing. I didn't get that wrong, did I? Um. Hello? Oh, um, it works. Oh, <laughs> Mike one, Mic one works. Right, they didn't want the lawyer to talk. OK. Um, that's, a, that's sort of the story of my life. Um, anyway, so you guys missed the really funny opening I had. So now we'll have to move on to the next, uh, move on to the next uh, part of the talk here. So. Um, uh, as Nick said, I'm a, a lawyer, Ram Johnny, uh, with Vetter Price. I've uh, been the part of the ETA community here in Chicago for a long time. Um, have done search fund transactions really my whole career. I've been practicing law for 15 years. Um, and our law firm is an international law firm. We do M&A transactional work for search funds, but obviously, you know, all private equity and, and M&A corporate transactions as well. Um, and, uh, and the favorite part of my work, though, is certainly ETA transactions, working with searchers, working with entrepreneurs, working with young CEOs um, who are running companies that are, you know, doing things in the world, building, uh, you know, building widgets, building bridges, um, you know, providing services, doing all of those sorts of things. And, and so the, our panel today is really bringing to light some of the differences between the, the career paths that people go into um, to get into the ETA space and to talk a little bit about the, the different types of ETA that you could do. So when I think about ETA, there's sort of a spectrum. There's a traditional searcher. Everybody sort of understands that. There's, you know, 10 investors. They each get 10% of the fund, and, and the searcher has a lot of power in that um, <clears throat> scenario. The investors are, are diffuse. Um, there's an accelerator model, so you can be an ETA within an accelerator. Um, you can do ETA as a private equity-backed EIR. Um, you can be in a family office, sort of a captive within a family office to do ETA through that um, environment. You can be a self-funded. Um, I used to call them unfunded, but you know, the funds do have to come from somewhere. It's just self-funded. Um, and then th there are sort of, on the far end of the spectrum, there's an there's a independent sponsor or sort of an active independent sponsor maybe where, where you have a, a chairman type role. So um, each of these panelists has a different, had, had a different way of getting into ETA, and I think that's probably a good way to, I'll have them introduce themselves, we'll just kind of go down the row here, have them introduce themselves and talk about their version of ETA and kind of why they did it, how, made, how they made that decision. So we'll start with Tim Meng. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Meng, uh, graduated from Booth in 2012. My journey leading up to ETA really, um, Really, there were two chapters in my life before ETA itself. The first was entrepreneurial and really in the technology startup space. And is then following that, I spent seven years in the management consulting space until I figured out I'm really not a good fit for the vice industry, more of the outcome industry. Uh, at some point in early 2014 and later 2015, I decided to look into search fund on the advice of my wife, who actually paid attention at Booth. We know the thing about search fund. Uh, and that's really when I started my search into or exploration into the space. Uh, and that is, that is also at a time where search itself is well established. Accelerator as a concept is fairly new. So when I first look at the search fund accelerator as a concept, as an option for myself, it was really new. So I made a lot of assumptions and took a lot of time to think about the decision, which I'm happy to share later. Uh, eventually, it is the relationship built with the founders of Search Fund Accelerator that allowed me to start as a member of the first cohort in 2015. Uh, acquired the business in 2016, and I just crossed a three-year anniversary run in one source communications. Hello? Okay, that works. <laughs> uh, so, name's Raymond Fan. Um, I graduated in 2016 at Kellogg. Um, I, prior to business school, I was uh, doing lower middle market private equity for about five, six years. Um, and then before that, I was an investment banker um, and really got into search um, because I wanted to operate a business. Um, so on the investing side, I kind of always had this urge um, to kind of go out and execute. 
And so that, that was the genesis for me going to business school. Um, I had um, the opportune kind of fortune of when I was a banker. I had actually worked on the Sherian deal a couple times um, as they kind of recapped. Um, so I kind of knew the power of the search fund model. Um, and so when I went to business school, I was thinking about kind of how to kind of slice that and, and do that. Um, what I ended up doing was uh, I did an executive uh, in residence with a lower middle market private equity firm, um, searched for, call it six months, um, found a business, um, and I've been executing it for uh, the past two and a half years, and then I just exited um, uh, three weeks ago. So, um, uh, Oh, and then the company is, uh, so it's a multi-unit dermatology group, um, and I live out in Los Angeles, and I've just been growing it ever since. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Curry. Uh, I am the CEO of now what is Apex Physics Partners, which was formerly Kruger Gilbert Health Physics. I graduated from Booth in 2013. And um, as a career path, I really found out about the search fund model in 2008. Um, I was, of all things, running a men's custom clothing business. Um, and one of my uh, best paying clients actually um, was a search operator. Um, and prior to that, I'd never really thought about buying um, a going concern and operating and growing that business um, and made the decision to go down the path and uh, went to Booth, um, was pretty singularly minded in terms of career path. I knew that I was going to do ETA. Um, it's really amazing to see um, all of the folks in this room um, I, I definitely felt like the ugly duckli duckling at Polsky and other places because myself and a couple of other folks that I see um, were kind of the crazy folks that were thinking about going down the path. Um, I did the search with a partner. I actually see some of my search investors in the room. Um, and the decision to do uh, the traditional search model, one, um, the model uh, had success, so there was some structure to it. Um, I. My previous experience, I had seen independent sponsors and other folks um, go out, buy companies, and not really have um, mentorship or, or guidance. Um, and, and folks who had been there done that to help you kind of stay on the guardrails. And my partner and I thought that that was going to be an important ingredient to success. Um, we also uh, were pretty cognizant that we didn't know what we didn't know. And so our thought was when we uh, formed our uh, formed our search fund. Uh, we were very intentional about being operator heavy and not investor heavy. Um, so we wanted to work alongside folks that had really sat in the seat and uh, successfully run and grown a business. So that's kind of uh, how we got here in April of this year. Um, we exited the business, and my partner and I um, signed up for the second round with a, a private equity sponsor, um, and we continue to grow to grow the business. Good morning. Uh, my name is Charles Mullinger. I'm the CEO of Ethos Evacuation Strategies. I graduated from Booth in 2017. Prior to that, I was an officer in the US Army. Um, I, I was intimately familiar with, with the ETA path and ETA models uh, while I was at Booth. Took the course, and I was able to TA the course with uh, Brian and Mark. So I became really familiar with, with the different models. Um, out of Booth, I actually joined a family office, private equity firm in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where I was from. Uh, I spent a little over a year there and just had the itch to do a search. So uh, wanted to stay in St. Louis, wanted to, wanted to kind of stay geographical because I'm married and I have kids. Uh, so there was a little, little uh, you know, constrained there, I guess. Um, and I made my wife move around in the Army for the better part of a decade, so I wanted to keep her happy. Um, so what I, what I ended up doing was uh, kind of a mix between being self-funded and having an independent sponsor, but also having a group of investors who were looking at all the deals that I was seeing. Uh, the independent sponsor was a family member, so uh, we were looking uh, for smaller deals, hoping that it would just be him and I investing in the company, and that is exactly what ended up happening. So I, I closed on a deal uh, nine months ago, and it was just a family member and I who uh, put up the equity to buy the business. Um, now I'm sitting here today in front of you. Great. Um, so I think that gives you an idea of kind of who's up here. And, and <clears throat> they're all in the CEO seat now. And they all got there kind of through different paths. And, and there's lot, lots of different ways to do it. Um, 
So I kind of want to talk about resources during the search and how, how those are distinct and different between the groups. So Michael, maybe let's start with you. As a traditional searcher, um, what was it like during your search and who were the sort of resources or what were the resources that you used as a traditional searcher during your search? Um, that's a good question. I, I think the most vital resource um, in the traditional search, if leveraged properly, are the investors. So um, I think, you know, you know, I think all in we had 17 investors and it's, it's not realistic to say that you're gonna be able to manage and have communication with all 17 investors throughout the course of a process. Um, but we did gravitate towards, I would say, four or five um, investors that we did have frequent communication with. Um, and they were really helpful in terms of helping us think through best practice and they had seen searchers um, kind of build internship programs. Um, they had seen searchers kind of build databases they had seen searchers successfully do kind of outreach campaigns, and, and, and they had a bit of a flavor for what was successful and what had not been successful. I think the other thing that was helpful in terms of resource is ultimately the search investors are the first, uh, kind of the first source of capital, or they get kind of the first pass at the deal. Um, and it was really helpful to think through informally how my investors thought about businesses um, and not having to kind of put together with pomp and circumstance kind of a full sim, but really here's a two pager, here's the business, here's the industry, you know, here are the things I'm thinking about, what may I be missing? Um, and being able to kind of triangulate with that, with that core group of four or five investors, folks that I think would have a high degree of believability and say, you know, for example, hey AJ, what am I missing? Or based on your experience, what have you seen that I might want to think about and having those independent voices, and if I got kind of some of the same themes from different investors who are not on the phone at the same time or not meeting face to face, that did kind of help me frame that's an area that may be a risk that I may not want to take or that I'm definitely going to have to think through how to mitigate. So I think for me, kind of the most useful resource was having that sounding board of people who ultimately ended up backing the deal, helping to understand how they thought about businesses and how they thought about risk. I think one of the things that is a challenge uh, when you go down this path is you have to have a healthy dose of optimism uh, to, you know, to kind of say, I'm going to go out, I'm going to find a company, right? Me and this seller are going to work something out. I'm going to do a good job and deliver value to my investors. But I think having that optimism tempered with realism is really helpful to make sure that you don't get ahead of your skis and you don't uh, and you don't miss something. I, I would just put a point on that. One of um, one of my search investors, when we were looking um, at the deal that we eventually bought, uh, gave me some really good advice. Um, and we were talking about the deal, and he could tell that my partner and I were really excited. And he said, "Hey, can you just do me a favor? Um, can you go to the whiteboard um, and write in big letters?" I am no longer rational, um, he said, because, it, which is not a bad thing, but it was a sense check to say, hey, you're about to go under LOI, right? There are two types of diligence, right? There is confirmatory, and there's the diligence that says this may be the thing that I'm going to be in for the next five to seven years of my life, and so I'm not necessarily just going to go through this process to tick the boxes or to gloss over the things that may be potential risks that blow myself up and I think that was really helpful advice to make sure that as you're going through the process of looking at companies and evaluating the risk that you are going to take on, having a healthy dose of realism and having folks um, who had been in situations um, before was helpful for me. I mean, I think that was a key resource for me in my process. No, I, think that's, I, mean, I think that's great and then clearly with a you know, multitude of investors, you're going to have um, you know, varying viewpoints, and I think that that can be helpful to a process. Ray, what about you? You had one significant equity backer. Was it was it different for you? Yeah. So I um, I did the executive in residence. Um, so it was a little middle market firm called uh, Gemini Investors. They had been in the business for 20 years, so they had established relationships in the market with bankers and brokers and everything. And um, so my process, I, I kind of cheated the search in the sense that um, I kind of did uh, a little bit of the traditional search. So I had interns, I was looking for businesses and everything. Um, but uh, they actually uh, gave me deal flow. So I would, um, I relocated to Boston, uh, worked out of the private equity offices, 
uh, I would go to their Monday morning meetings, um, and then that's when they kind of discuss their, their, the businesses that are coming in uh, through their pipeline, and um, I would figure out whether it was a good fit for me, uh, geography-wise, uh, industry-wise, um, and just whether it was something that um, I would be willing to run for, you know, five, six years of my life. Um, so that was really nice to kind of have that uh, deal flow to get ideas. Um, and um, yeah, uh, I wasn't there all too long. I was uh, there for six months, had a bunch of different looks at a bunch of different businesses, um, and then ultimately found that uh, business that um, I'm running now, um, you know, within kind of the six month period. Um, and, you know, part of the reason that I chose that was um, that path was uh, I looked at kind of the primer. If you guys look at the GSB primer, there's that chart of um, probability of success, probability of failure, finding a business. Once you find a business, probability of success, probability of failure. And um, I was, I looked at that chart and I was trying to figure out how to mitigate risk out of kind of all those different elements. And obviously the first part of that stage is whether you can find a business. Um, and certainly I've been in lower middle market before. I knew the markets were getting more efficient. Um, I knew it was, you know, relatively tough to find a business. It's a tough process to, to search. Um, and um, yeah, so the idea of partnering with a private equity firm um, to kind of mitigate some of that risk and give me some of that deal flow um, was conceptually um, a good idea for me and, and as I went through kind of the process and thought about all the different paths. Um, and then, you know, once you find the business, then there's the capital uh, problem. And so, um, uh, you know, there's uh, people have different opinions, single source of capital versus kind of 14, 15 different investors. Um, and um, from my perspective, I thought that if I could find like a good source of capital, you know, people that um, I believed in that were good kind of um, investors and really thoughtful and kind of thought the same way that I thought, um, that yeah, there's some risk that, you know, if you go down a single point of capital that it could turn out really bad, um, but could also turn out really well. Um, and so that was kind of, um, you know, part of the reason that I partnered with them is, you know, deal flow. And then um, I thought they were good kind of investors and good people and got to know them um, and everything. Um, and then as we kind of migrated to finding the deals and everything, um, uh, yeah, during the diligence process, you know, they, they have 130 portfolio companies. Um, so they've been there, done that. Um, you know, I had some investing background, so I kind of knew how to do a lot of that stuff as well. Um, but uh, certainly they had done it way more than I had. And so they hired the QV firm, we had, they hired the lawyers. Um, what I thought I was really good at um, was, and another reason I picked the path that I chose was um, because I was an investor before, I thought I was really good at picking industries and um, just having that space and time to kind of think about industries, really thoughtful about the investment thesis, really thoughtful about how I was gonna execute my plan over the next couple of years when I did find that business, um, that was invaluable. And so they did a lot of diligence. I certainly did some of the diligence, but for me, I spent a lot of my time on um, just building up the investment thesis and figuring out whether it was something that I really wanted and, and whether it was just you know a good investment. Um, and so yeah, so they did a bunch of the diligence, financing, all that stuff. Um, I did a little bit of a hybrid kind of thing because they weren't willing to pay my salary, but I was a poor college student. Um, so I went out to a lot of like my former, former bosses. Um, they gave me some search capital just to pay my salary over my search process. And I went to some of the traditional searches. So it's kind of a little bit of a hybrid between traditional and um, you know, um, executive and residence at a private equity firm. So I think that, I mean, that's really helpful, Ray. And I think it, again, <clears throat> kind of brings out the distinction. And my hunch is, Tim, your answer would be similar um, if we talk about resources during the search as a, as a part of the accelerator. So I'm going to make your question a little bit harder. Um, you are, by the way, my favorite Tim associated with SFA. Um, so I'm not <laughs> sure if uh, Bovard is in the room. But um, <laughs> anyway, I, I, and I, would, I, I love asking this question of Tim Bovard on panels. Actually, Tim Bovard is the, the person who runs SFA, as many of you know. Um, I think one of the, the hard questions, or one of the things that people talk about with, it, with an accelerated model is a, is a um, lack of autonomy. Um, is that, did you feel that way? Do you feel like that's a valid <coughs> criticism? Um, would you agree or disagree with the assessment that if you're in an accelerator, you have less autonomy? Um, so I think a, a little bit of a disclaimer. <laughs> uh, I have a data point of one. 
And when I was thinking about it, an accelerator, there was virtually no accelerator around. In fact, even SFA was so new, and I hope nothing embarrassed Tim, that the moment I sent him an email setting up a conversation, I got a response in under a second. And it's not because he was eager to speak to me because the email didn't work. Right? That, that was how early <laughs> the accelerator was. And so, uh, so what I'm about to share is specifically related to my experience with Search Fund Accelerator. And that, so then coming back to the point of the word autonomy, um, I think that that's a rational conclusion if you just look at the, you know, the power dynamics, the structure, the relationship. Most, most of us are smart enough to get to that word, but that word is fairly abstract. So if you want to unpack a little bit, if, we are, if we're thinking about the absolute, the absolute extreme of autonomy, meaning you do whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want, then I don't think any model on this panel can support that autonomy, right? In fact, any professionally financed business can now support the level of autonomy. Maybe we work, but you know. Uh, <laughs> but so then you pull back from that, is then if you just be a little bit more tactical about what is autonomy. And to me, when I made those assumptions, and unfortunately for me at the time, there is no data point or reference that I can check. So I essentially place my face in the interaction, the relationship I built with Tim and with Jeremy early on. Now, I have been through this, this will be my fifth year of relationship with SFA. Um, so if I look back at uh, autonomy, really I think I want to translate that either lack of autonomy or autonomy into do you want a heightened degree of intellectual honesty and challenge around you? Because of the interaction model, meaning that Tim and Jeremy knew very well about the deal I had. It's not a once a year, once a quarter, I send a five pager and they get caught up with the business. They know about the business not as well as I do, but very well, which means it keeps me honest and, and keeps me in critical thinking mode at all times. Um, I came from professional services background, so I would use the reference. I, I assume a lot of folks come from that background. So all of us have that experience when you're working in that industry. It's 10 p.m., you want to go home, you send out a deck or a model, and your MD or your partner came back and say, hey, make these five changes. A lot of us in that moment would say, so then, you have to do it. But in, with some distance, all of us will at least recognize, you know what, those advice were good. It just he didn't want to take it at that moment because he want to go home. <laughs> but those were rational and good recommendations. And I would relate that experience to my interaction in that I'm always intellectually honest because the interaction model is so transparent and they understand my business. All right, I was trying to trip Tim up. You, never, you can never trip up Tim here on a, on a, with a question. Um, Charles, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to you on the autonomy question though. You, you tell me if, if your version of ETA, do you think it, um, do you think the way that you did it allowed you some more flexibility that maybe helped you get to a closing fast and is that a, you know, always a good thing or, or, or what do you think about your version and, and sort of autonomy and speed to closing a transaction? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I, I, uh, yes, I definitely had a little bit more autonomy than someone who does a traditional search and has 20 investors asking them how things are going all the time. Um, but with that autonomy becomes another challenge of being inside your own head, which is a, a whole another level of multiple voices telling you you're doing things right or doing things wrong. Uh, so there's pros and cons to every model. Every, everyone up here would nod their head at that, that no matter which way you end up going, there's pros and cons. Um, for me, the, the autonomy and, and wanting to do more of a geographical focus um, was kind of made me take a step back and think, all right, how can I play to my strengths here? If I'm gonna do this in St. Louis, what, what can I do that's really gonna differentiate yourself? There's a lot of money out there right now. Business owners are getting pinged every single day by people like you who wanna go out and buy their company. I've been operating this business for nine months and people are already talking to me about wanting to buy my company. And I, I, it, it, there's a lot of people out there looking, right? So one of the things you wanna do is, is figure out how to differentiate yourself. And I actually used the St. Louis story to, to, my, to my benefit. I, I was able to tell a great story. I was able to sit down with business owners and explain to them that I was born and raised there, but my wife was born and raised there, that we wanna raise our kids there. 
um, that I want to invest in the community and be a part of all the, the great things that are happening in the city of St. Louis. Um, so it really was the utilizing uh, the strengths that you have. Um, the autonomy was, was one of those, uh, I was in my head a lot, truthfully. Um, but using the people that are in this audience today is another thing that I leaned on and being intimately familiar with this model and being intimately familiar with, with the community. Um, I was calling probably a lot of the people in this room, the, you know, speaking with Brian O'Connor and Mark Agnew and um, August Felker, people who, who have done and seen these deals all the time. And I meet them at conferences like this and I was able to lean on them. So whatever path you go, uh, you're going to have a network of people who are going to be helpful for you, um, whether you have the autonomy or not. But if you do choose a path with, with a lot of autonomy, that my recommendation would be is have some mentors in your back pocket. Um, make sure you are, have people who are going to be that gut check for you when you find a business um, and be able to get seven, eight opinions as opposed to potentially just your own opinion or the one or two investors who are going to be in on your deal. Great. Well, um, why don't we sort of shift gears a little bit here? And, and I know I want to get, I do want to get to um, questions and answers here at the, you know, for, for a bit at the end because I think it's more important to, you know, have these guys who are up here answer the questions that you guys have in your head than to, to sort of listen to prepared remarks or anything like that. But I, I do, I would like to hear maybe um, kind of from each person, what are, um, how has your career evolved as you've been in the CEO seat? And then kind of where do you think you're headed next? And I think there's, you know, the where are you headed next is maybe for a little more for Mike and Ray um, and the kind of how has your career evolved is kind of for everybody. Um, and, and maybe we'll start with you, Mike. Um, just kind of give us a give us a little bit of how has your you know CEO career evolved? Where do you think you're headed next? But you know, and not a not a big long speech, but just you know a couple minutes. Sure. Um, the CEO path has has been challenging, to be honest. I think for high achieving type A personality people, um, I don't think there's anything that prepares you for the seat until you sit in the seat. Um, and so I think that there's just a certain level of humility that when you start on the path, um, you realize that you, know, you have a spreadsheet and you've put together a presentation, but that in many cases does not jive with reality. Um, I think you know, one of the most critical moments I think of my CEO path was uh, a former searcher who was probably three years ahead of me um, and was a buddy of mine from undergrad. Um, I was driving home and he had a call with me um, and my partner. And he let us complain about employees and the board and you know, competitors not understanding business and pricing services really low. Um, and he had a really sage piece of advice, which was you do realize that it's all your fault. Um, and what he meant by that was, you may not have caused all of those problems, but you have to shift your mindset from being a victim to being responsible for the outcome. So you own it, right? So you own the business, you own the problems, you own the mistakes, and, and that's just a really big shift. And, and that's what I think shifted it for us from being kind of reactive to being proactive leaders of the business and kind of driving towards the results that we wanted. Um, I think the role has also changed in terms of um, a lot of people's backgrounds here are, are being you know, highly paid individual contributors. You, you realize really quickly that trying to push a rock uphill by yourself doesn't work. And so realizing that your role is not to do everything um, and really having to rely on, you know, I had a, you know, I have a business partner, but really relying on your team to drive the result and making the shift from being an individual contributor to also kind of being a coach of your team and, and really finding the right people and giving them the tools to be successful and finding kind of your success from what your team has accomplished versus your individual success. success. And so I think that's kind of where my career path is headed. Um, my partner and I um, read up with the private equity fund, so we're gonna continue to manage the business. But I think overall, um, I would like to be a contributing member of this ETA community. Um, I think that there's an opportunity um, to increase the diversity of folks that go down this path. 
um, you know, from an ethnic perspective, from a gender perspective, but then also from a background perspective. Um, I think that there's a lot to be gained. I think one of the biggest things I will say is when you take the stance that really you are responsible, it's a huge opportunity for personal growth and development because at the end of the day, there really is no one to blame. The buck does stop with you and it forces you to be self-aware in a space that I was not from a, from a professional standpoint. I, I think that's great. It looks like I'm getting the stop sign from the back, and I was telling these guys uh, before this that I, I was on a, a panel a couple months ago, and, and p there were not stop signs and that sort of thing, and somebody went, you know, basically right through a break and right through the beginning of my next panel, and so I'm, I'm a little I'm sympathetic to the fact that we got to follow the rules here. So um, why don't we um, take some questions now? Um, and then we will, uh, you know, we'll kind of, you can direct your question to a, a, a panelist. Nick, will we take, you'll take the mic to the person that raised your hand? Yeah, okay, I mean, I think right here in the, in the front row um, to start. And, we'll, and uh, if you could direct your question maybe to one panelist or if it's to two, that's okay too, but we'll just kind of take one person's answer. How did you find the business you bought? Let's go to Tim. How did I find the business? Um, <laughs> I would say it's a 12 months of proprietary search and 16 months of really hard work. <laughs> Eventually, I end up speaking to a broker. So it's a lot of hard work and a lot of luck. Uh, maybe, uh, I mean, Ray, you want to take that? Just just went through an exit. Uh, yeah, so um, going in, I thought I would hold a lot longer than I actually did. Um, I operated the business for two and a half years, um, but it was uh, the decision to actually uh, exit. Um, it was because everybody around the table thought it was the best decision to make. Um, so it was kind of unanimous that um, uh, to sell earlier versus continue to kind of uh, pot along and continue to grow. Um, and um, the decision to sell was, um, in large part, it's just kind of like the nature of the industry, which is um, I did multi-unit healthcare, um, so doing a lot of acquisitions, um, and um, you know the doctors are your product. Um, and so the idea of scaling really quick, uh, getting some diversification, both in, both in owners on the doctor side and the private equity side, um, shifts the power a little bit, um, and then the um, by you know expanding really quick, um, you get some re revenue diversification amongst your products, which are in this case my doctors. So um, I went from you know 20 doctors um, in nine locations, partnered with our independent board member, um, and so now we have 100 doctors um, across the nation, 500 employees, and so. Um, uh, and now we have uh, a family office um, investing in us. Now we have the capital to go out, go out and do more aggressive acquisitions and, and everything and just kind of continue scaling. Um, so um, our decision to, even though I didn't really think I was going to sell that early, um, uh, just kind of the, the, the parameters of the industry and what was going on in the industry and what was best for the business and best for us um, kind of um, was the impetus for um, us deciding to kind of sell a bit earlier than, than we did. Hi, I'm Allison Humphrey, uh, current student at Booth. I have a question about just the dynamic of coming into a company that has established, um, I guess, tribal knowledge, as well as just working with the already existing culture. So yeah, my question is going towards him. It took me a while to understand that part of the culture is the asset you're buying. Um, and as in a culture like all things, or even just a, you know, comparing a business to an individual, 
You might have your best friend, you like his personality, their aspect uh, that is not perfect. It may, it may not work well with that. So think of that culture as a, your best friend's personality, right? How do you maximize the culture that philosophically aligns with yours and is then gradually work away the things you have some dis differences. So that takes time. That's probably something that is not something you can put on a project plan, <laughs> you have tactical and then you start executing. But I guess to take a, a less thoughtful answer is take time, live it, breathe it, and do not judge it too early. And it took me roughly six to 10 months before I can honestly say I got the culture and my first impression was absolutely wrong. So that's at least my experience. Um, a, a lot of our staff members were, are highly educated and, and very technical in nature. So uh, coming in, they were pretty open about their skepticism and doubt and the fact that my partner and I had no idea what we were doing and they were right. Um, so again, I, th I think in terms of culture, the advice that I give to folks who go down this path is that um, a lot of times we forget that we're looking for a business and we want to buy a company and we want to work with investors and create all these great uh, outcomes, but it's I, 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 me, me, me. Um, and really, I think the best way to start a relationship is not taking, but giving. So one of the things that we did early on was we really, we actually got out of the room, we brought in someone to facilitate a, a two-day workshop with all employees to tell us what was wrong, what the fears, concerns were. And so our first task in the first six months were what ways can we demonstrate that we are, we're here not just for ourselves, but we're here um, to help the company and helping the company means you know, doing things to make individual team members uh, jobs easier or better or more productive. So I would just say, you know, before you can change the culture, you have to understand the culture. But I think the best way to ingratiate yourself into a culture is figure out what you can give before you take because no one in the company cares about the SIM and the spreadsheet up to the right that you sold investors. You have to build that trust. And I think giving of yourself and, and showing that you're not too good to do work, I think is the easiest way for people to, to see that you mean what you say. Good morning, thanks for being here. Quick question, uh, well, Michael, a couple questions. Can you talk about what Apex does quickly and uh, whether having a board of 17 investors and advisors helped you? I don't see a, a history of health background in your background, but uh, how that mitigated the risk of going into an industry that you may not be so, uh, so Apex Physics Partners uh, effectively is a support organization for medical physics practices. So Kruger Gilbert is based in the Mid-Atlantic, and so we service hospitals and imaging centers uh, doing radiation safety and compliance. And so when we exited the business um, and partnered with our new partner, uh, Blue Sea Capital, um, we realized that culture is really important. And asking other practices in other parts of the company, uh, other parts of the country to join us under the banner of Kruger Gilbert wasn't gonna work. And so we were very intentional about saying, hey, although Kruger Gilbert existed since 1987, Apex is a brand new company and is six months old at this point. Um, we Just yesterday we wrapped our first Apex leadership retreat um, where we had practice leaders from Texas and Ohio who are, who are our newest partners. Um, and so we were very intentional about doing that. Um, in terms of not having um, experience and how kind of having investors um, and advisors to kind of come up that curve, um, I think most of, most of the learning, the specific knowledge, industry knowledge is just on the job training. I think where investors and advisors were helpful um, was more kind of business functions and business processes. So regardless of, um, regardless of industry, right, managing your cash flow, you know, the nuts and bolts of kind of HR and motivating people, but I think we had to roll up our sleeves and really just learn from our staff, frankly, the nuts and bolts of what we actually deliver. One, I think. 
take that one from the back. question is for Charles. Um, Charles, you mentioned that you have a family and uh, children as well. How have you been able to integrate them, kind of bring them along in that process? As you, as you said, you, you uh, went through a geographic search for that. So I think that's one of the reasons. Uh, what, what was the, uh, how have you brought them into the process of the business and this whole? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, well, my wife is in sales and marketing, so I go to her for almost everything. Uh, when, you, when you spend your career before taking this path blowing things up, you don't know a lot about sales and marketing. Um, so a, she's very ingrained in, in what I'm doing on a daily basis. All, all of my strategic planning, um, everything that I do goes, goes through her. Uh, so she, she is very involved with the business. Uh, we sell evacuation devices, so evacuation sleds as well. So my two little girls love getting in the sleds and seeing what daddy does at work. Uh, so that, that's, that's a cool spin to it as well. But having, having the backing uh, from them mentally from the beginning was really important. Um, ensuring that uh, this is entrepreneurship. You know, you, you are buying a profitable business and you're taking a path down a good investment, but it, it is absolutely entrepreneurship. You are going to be very lonely. You could be working in the basement of a strip mall, which is what I'm doing right now, underneath a Chinese restaurant. Um, so <laughs> having that, uh, having that back, background and support from, from your family is very important. And having those really honest conversations is I'm taking a path that is a, a little bit different than your typical Chicago Booth MBA. And there's going to be a lot of ups and downs in that path. But uh, having the support from her and our, our family around us as well was a, was a huge part of it. And being at home is a huge part of that as well. Uh, her family is there, so um, having, having that support is big. Yeah. I think we've maybe got time for two more. There's one right here, I think. My name is also for uh, Charles. A little similar. Going down the path of the in independent kind of sponsored search, um, you laid out some of the advantages that that poses. What were some of the disadvantages that you felt compared to some of the other members of the fight? I don't know, how did you overcome those? Uh, accountability is, is the big thing. Um, I don't have a built-in board of directors. I'm going to put together a board of advisors. I have not done it yet because I, I still want to spend more time in the business to determine who the right people would be. Um, but having that built-in accountability would be, would be nice. Uh, and having incredibly smart people in the room looking at my financials every month, uh, as opposed to me and uh, a couple of people that I trust in the business and then uh, my family member who invested in the business with me. Um, so it, that would probably be the biggest con, is um, you know, in this room, all the people in here who are going to be investors or at SFA or NGP, you automatically get that built-in crew of people who are going to guide you to success. Whereas uh, in my situation, it probably feels a little bit more lonely. Um, but you know, again, it's leaning on the mentors that you have. When you have a burning question about something or you're looking at a bolt-on acquisition or your books didn't really turn out the way they thought they, they were gonna be, um, you are surrounding yourselves just by nature of being at Kellogg or, at, or Booth uh, having those people that you can call, so leaning on them all the time is something that I find myself doing. Yeah, that's a great question too. I, um, first of all, I found a company that really fit my background well, um, and I, I'm doing something that I truly love. Like I'm, I'm, tomorrow, I'm flying to Paris to go to an international military and police conference. So, I, with my military background and being able to sell and have those conversations on a daily basis, I'm, I'm absolutely loving it. So, could I see myself running this company in 15 years? Absolutely. Um, does that mean there's an exit in that 15 years in hopes that I'm still running the company? Maybe. Um, but I, I would say that I lean more towards investing for the long term on this because I did find such a good fit for me and I see so much white space opportunity in the industry that, I, that I'm playing in. Um, now, if, if Honeywell or some huge safety products company came up to me and, and wanted to partner, am I going to turn down that opportunity? Probably not. Um, you, you keep an open mind. I'm only nine months in, so that's why I'm kind of wishy-washy on my answer. But uh, I did not go into this investment uh, thinking about an exit in five years. I modeled it that way, but I also modeled it in a way that, that I would hold it for 10 to 12 years. 
Um, so I think having, having those few different models and knowing how to do that and making sure that it's going to be able to fit the lifestyle that you want to live and that you're going to be able to create value along the, the lifetime of the investment is how you should look at it. Great. Well, <clears throat> I think, um, Nick, you can tell me if I still have more time, but I kind of think we're at the end of our um, road here. We're out of time. All right. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks to the um, tremendous panel that we had here. Um, appreciate everybody coming out today, and uh, we'll see you around the rest of the day.